and uh, the idea behind this wonderful program of uh, Indica Moksha is to take one weekend and uh, be immersed in the knowledge of the self because through this immersion alone one has a uh, uh, one has a better assimilation of the knowledge so if we want the knowledge to be uh, more than just a smattering that we we can mouth but then we have difficulty walking the talk then this kind of frequent immersions this is what is in order so i thank you hari for introducing me and for being willing to uh, be the moderator of uh, this session and um, it is uh, a, a joy and a delight to uh, partake of this and uh, we have chosen for you uh, a, a text that is a very wonderful text it is called Swarupa Anusandhana Ashtakam Ashtakam Octet so eight verses to <laughs> enlightenment basically uh, uh, we can look at it like that and that is in a way uh, you know within the uh, within the method of communicating the knowledge you know uh, a sextet meaning six verses like nirvana shatkam octet ashtakam and uh, like this panchakam maya panchakam five verses so like a quintet and so like this we have uh, you know the, there is a very nice uh, what is that called there is a uh, pratha a custom uh, in the shastra to be able to you know do this and the uh, even though prose is encouraged but the, the power of poetry is something not to be laughed at because when the the same thing is mentioned in verse uh, there, there is a, a stronger uh, there is a better assimilation a stronger identification and so the verses and meters and all are very very carefully chosen and so Swarupa means one's own nature. And what is the big thing about Swarupa? The, the main thing we know, need to know about, about Swarupa is Swarupasya na nivrittihi. Niv, nivritti means uh, uh, removal, change. Na nivrittihi means the Swarupa is that which cannot be changed. Swarupa literally means nature. My own nature, Swarupa. Swa, my own. Rupa, nature. So, my own nature, you know, when you say my own nature, it uh, usually includes a mix of elements, things that can be changed and things that cannot be changed. Like you say, for example, if one were to say, my nature is to get angry whenever anybody opposes me. <laughs> that <laughs> is that really your nature? <laughs> no, uh, because that can change. That can change and that does change. That does, does change. Oh, I my nature is to love all kinds of sweet things. That also changed. When? When the diagnosis of high sugar was made by the doctor, that immediately changed. I learned to like other things than sugar. So, obviously, you know, my nature is to be very strong. Okay? Maybe in your 20s, but then in your 60s, 70s, <laughs> no. When you're 22, yeah, the nature is to be strong, you can say. So, as you can see, the word nature shifts its definition. Whether we talk about the body, whether we talk about the mind, whether we talk about the emotions, or whether we talk about raga and dvesha, likes and dislikes. This is the, uh, you know, this is the, uh, this is the changing aspect of what is called my own nature or what we think to be one's own nature. There is, however, deeper within that when those surface level changes have been accounted for and understood, who is the one observing the one who is changing? Who is the one who is observing the changing nature? This is what we have to ask. And the one that is observing the changing nature is none other than the changeless one. The changeless I who is naturally contented, 
who is naturally free, who is naturally uh, happy, who is naturally non-demanding, contented, appreciative person. That is the changeless nature. That is how you are in sleep. In sleep, nobody demands anything. Before sleep, you demand, yes. When you wake up, the demands rise. Where is my coffee? Where is my morning tea? That the demands come. But in sleep, no demands. Very, very interesting to see this vyabhijara, this contradiction. In sleep, there, are, there is absolutely, there is no demand at all. None whatsoever, no demands. Why? How? Because sleep is a form of liberation, is a form of freedom. In sleep, there are no demands. In sleep, you have what we call moksha, total freedom from being demanding. Whether you have moksha or not in sleep, all the loved ones have moksha from you when you sleep because you are not demanding. Okay, so this is this is definitely the case. You have no demands, you have no worries, you are you are contented. Why? Because you don't want to get up. That contentment from sleep, one becomes very agitated when the sleep is not there, when one is not able to sleep. That is why there is this agitation. So therefore, what? So therefore. The, the, the uh, understanding here, so when you call, when we say Swarupa, in Vedanta Shastra, in, in, the, in the knowledge that reveals this unchanging self. So this is the self that you want to be. This is who you think you know you are, but not fully somehow. Everybody wants to be happy. Everybody wants to be not stressed. There is a, some kind of a universal yearning to be free, to be limitless. And Vedanta Shastra unfolds that, uh, the, that truth. And so therefore, what? So therefore, this uh, idea, Swarupa, means we are not talking of the changing body and even faster changing mind, the changing sense organs, the changing raga dvesha, the changing moods, the changing emotions. We are talking of the changeless I, which is observing all these things and that which is observing all these things is has to be free of all these things. This is a law. This is a law. So in order to detect motion, and you know that which detects motion has to be motionless. If you're sitting in a train and then the other train is moving, there is a train on the next track, you are looking at that train. The other train is moving, how do you know? Because you are stationary. If you are also moving, you are unable to gauge the movement of that train. Similarly, and the, you know this is how it is, even in the matters of the self that is to be revealed. Even there, the, the one, if, if the moods are constantly changing and if I am the sum total of the moods, then I will not be able to discern anger. I will not be able to discern fear because I am also constantly changing. But I am able to tell you, now I am happy. <laughs> now I am angry. People are able to tell each other, you are able to say this. You are able to discern the emotions. I am angry. But the expression has to change because it's not that you are angry. You are the observer of the anger. I am hungry. There is a wrong association with the prana. So therefore what? I am the observer of that which is, um, I am the observer of a condition called hunger. I am restless. I am the observer of the mental condition called the mind. I am sad. I am the observer of the emotion called sorrow. The observer is free of that which is observed. This is the basic premise of Vedanta, which, is, which we all know, which is very easy to forget because of what we call Atma Ajnanam, the self-ignorance. That's the translation of Atma Ajnanam, self-ignorance. Self-ignorance is what is the, uh, the problem here. And because of that, what happens? 
I am the, I am always thinking that I am one with the mind, one with the body, this wrong identification. And that wrong identification is interrupted by this text like every other text. And so here, Swarupa in this text means that I which I long to understand, which I know I am. I know I'm contented. I know I'm non-demanding. I know I'm limitless. I know I'm free. I know I'm whole. But, 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 dot, dot, dot. I don't seem to be able to understand that in the present time. I don't seem to be able to, to, to be assimilating this at all. And so that discrepancy is what this test text is going to bridge in a very, very clever way. So this is Swarupa. And since there is this contradiction between the self that I want to be and the self that I think I am and the self that I identify with, then that is why the Anusandhana is needed. What is Anusandhana? Enquiry. See, if I were already what I want to be, then there is no inquiry needed. And if I cannot be who I want to be, then also there is no inquiry that is needed because in that case, in the latter case, the inquiry is useless. If the inquiry is useless, then, uh, then what is the point? There is no point at all. And so therefore, the inquiry becomes necessary when things are not what they seem. Whether we are talking of a, a what should I say, a, a government inquiry against a politician. You know, the politician is not what he or she seems. They seem to be very wonderful and they seem to be very caring. When? Only during the time of the elections. <laughs> and then after that, suddenly, uh, you know, the, 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 the money is missing from the coffers. And so an inquiry against that person is launched because things are not as they seem. Here also, a kind of a self, an erzat self uh, that masquerades as I, that ahankara, which is the I notion, which is identified with everything. The I notion is identified with everything finite, everything temporary. And that I notion is masquerading as the I, but still mourning its condition. And yearning to be something it is not, that is when the inquiry is needed because there is a big gap between who I am and what I want to be. <laughs> that is what it is. Who I think I am and what I want to be. Therefore, the anusandhana or the inquiry is needed. The inquiry is needed. And so therefore what? This is why the ashtakam is the octet that gives this kind of, that enables this kind of an inquiry at the end of which we have hopefully a, a firmer understanding and a firmer grasp of what is it that, um, that, uh, uh, that is my nature and how to get in touch with this nature that, that I call myself in order to be more free, to be less bound, to feel less constricted, to understand that I am limitless. That is the subject matter of Vedanta. So Vedanta is not, in other words, Vedanta Shastra is not that which drills new knowledge into you. It is that which removes the ignorance and the wrong uh, the wrong identification where, to various things, it, it, it removes that. That is Vedanta. It doesn't really give new knowledge. How can it? Because you already know it. The self is known much like, you know, the example, the stock example giving, given here is much like the, uh, uh, much like something that is lying in the dark. You come home late at night and nowadays the, the light goes out early. The days are shorter and the nights are longer. So you come home at twilight and what do you see? Something with three bends lying in front of your door. 
You're afraid to even go unlock the door. Oh my God, what is this? Snake, eek. But fortunately, you have your cell phone and you turn the flashlight on. And then what happens? You understand that some children were playing in front of your house and it is just a skipping rope. It's a rope that is lying in this. But then your mind went to the place of not rope, but aropa. You superimposed a snake and got scared. You scared yourself by superimposing a snake. Why? Because that is where the source of fear is. That is where the fear is. That is where the problem is. So you superimposed a snake. Why? Because that snake is the product of your own fear. That fear was projected onto a thing. What kind of a thing? An unknown thing? No. You cannot be afraid of an unknown thing or an un, uh, you know, a thing that is totally unknown cannot be the cause of fear or the cause of any kind of a superimposition. Cannot. Think about it. How can you be afraid of something unknown? No. And similarly, a known thing cannot be cause of fear. Why? Because it is known. You can stay away from it. So you can stay away from it. So, so when you know something as something, there is no confusion. But where is the confusion? The confusion is in the partial knowledge. The partial knowledge. That is where the confusion is and that's where the confusion has to be corrected. So. I know there is something there, but I don't know what it is. And the not knowing what it is, the ajnanam of the rope makes it a sitting, the partial ajnanam of the nature of the rope makes it a sitting duck for all kinds of projection, snake, etc. Likewise, the, the, uh, the ajnanam of the adhishthana, adhishthana means the, the truth of the I. The ajnanam of this adhishthana makes me project all these things. All kinds of, all kinds of uh, aropas upon that I, which is not unknown, which is partially known. Partially known means what? I know I am. Aham asmi. I know. I am. I know. <laughs> Why? How do you know you are? Well, if I ask you the question, are you here? What will you say? <laughs> yes. <laughs> of course you will say yes. Yes, I am here. And when you say yes, I am here, that means what? You didn't have to ask anybody else. Do I exist? You don't have to ask. Without asking do I exist, you know you are here. It is just fantastic. It's absolutely fantastic. This is called Swatasiddha Atma, self-evident I, self-effulgent I. Upon this fact that I don't need to be established, the whole Vedanta Shastra is based. I know I am, but then don't ask me any more questions. Who are you? Deep philosophical questions. Please don't ask why, because the answer that will come is in keeping with the conditioning of childhood. Who are you? Idiot. <laughs> this is the answer that comes. Why? Because of so many conditionings and the internalizing of those conditionings. My guru, Swami Dayananda Ji, used to make a joke. He used to say, if you go to a, a you know, to some kind of a crowded hall you know, and you call out Rama. Rama is a very common Indian name. And then what? So half the people will say, yeah, me? Are you talking to me? And then, uh, you know, half the people will answer to that Rama. So many, you know, so many names are Rama, Rama. You know, uh, what is that? Uh, uh, you know, Jai Rama, Raja Rama, so many Rama. Ramas are there. Rama, half the people will answer. Another common name is what? Krishna. Then you go into the hall again and shout Krishna. The other half will answer. <laughs> the other half of the men that are there will answer because it's a very common name. Then Swamiji said, you can make another experiment. Go to the hall a third time and say, donkey, idiot. Then all of them will answer <laughs> because everybody feels a sense of 
want and a sense of wrong understanding of who they are. No confidence and a sense of lowliness. I'm not what I want to be. I'm not important. I feel lowly and I don't feel good. That's why I need all these things to, to collect and buttress my self-image. I have to keep seeking, seeking, seeking because only when I have a lot, somebody will respect me. Then you ask the person, why do you want somebody to respect you? Because the truth is I don't respect myself. That's why I want other people's validation. Somebody should say, aha, he is somebody, she is somebody. Look at her, look at him. Somebody has to keep saying. Then I feel validated. And the, and the path to the validation depends on too many things. Some people want to amass wealth as a ticket to validation. Some people want to amass a fame as a ticket to validation. Some people want to amass some kind of a, you know, make, make some kind of a legacy. Sometimes they say, I want to have a child. And if I have a child, that will be my validation because I've left something behind in this, uh, you know, in this, in this world. What have you left behind? Oh, I gave birth to a son, a daughter. Oh, but yeah, but they are in jail. Doesn't matter. <laughs> at least, at least they have left something. They are incarcerated. They are behind bars. No, but still it is important. Some kind of a way. I want to make a mark. I want to leave something behind. These pressures, these desires come from the original problem of knowing myself partially, like even the, the rope in the in twilight. The rope at twilight gives rise to all kinds of non-understanding. <laughs> the rope at twilight becomes a sitting duck for uh, being mistaken for a snake. And similarly, the eye, uh, the partially known eye, becomes a sitting duck for all kinds of superimpositions of limitlessness, fears, tears, and all kinds of wrong associations and wrong understanding and wrong identifications. This is what is, uh, this is where Vedanta makes an entry. This is where it has to. Because as the verses themselves will say, I won't give too much of an introduction because the, verse, the, the, the verses will introduce themselves. Very, very nice. As the verses will introduce themselves and, and reveal what? Reveal the fact that at some point with the right preparation of mind, when the mind is prepared, what will happen? <laughs> what will happen is that there will be a desire to know rather than the desire to become. This is the spiritual graduation. From the desire to become, the, uh, you know, I graduate into just the desire to be me. And how does this graduation happen? The, the, the verses themselves will explain. We will get into the um, we will get in the, into the text very, very soon. But before that, something about the text and the meter. Very, very nice. Um, maybe I'll share the uh, I'll share the screen, and so you we can look at the text together. That will be nice. Okay, let me do that. And that's the wrong one. Let's see which I am sharing. Hold on. Are you able to see anything at all? Yes. No. Yes, Swamini Ji. Yes. Okay. Let me see if I can also see it because I'm not uh, seeing this. Hold on. Yeah. So this is the one. Yes. Uh, here we go. So uh, Swarupa Anusandhana Ashtakam. It also has another name. Vijnana Nauka. Nauka means boat. The boat of knowledge. The boat of self-knowledge, boat of self-wisdom, you know. And why does it have the meaning of the word boat? Because the boat is needed when the boat is needed when you are crossing something which you cannot cross by car, by plane. <laughs> what do you need boat for? Even by swimming, uh, you you can swim, but you can't. But why why can't I swim here? The waters are dangerous, <laughs> so the ocean of samsara. <laughs> 
That's why the boat is needed because there are alligators. Half of the blessed animal is teeth. It, it can grab the leg like it did for Adi Shankara one time. It can grab the leg. And then there is the seaweed of uh, feeling obligated and feeling like I ha I'm bound to these people and I'm bound to these kinds of pursuits. Because after a lifetime, after a half a life of pursuing dysfunctional things like name, fame, etc., then what happens? Then you just, you know, you, you just don't know how to drop that habit. You just don't know how to drop that habit. And so, therefore, this is this is a uh, this this nauka will 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 rescue you from that habit. Will rescue you from the the the, the seaweed of 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 desire and depression. Depression, you know, desire always leads to depression because most of the desires cannot be fulfilled. <laughs> that is the that is why one keeps striving all the time, and so this is how it happens. And then uh, uh, this is the uh, this is why it is called vijnana nauka or swarupa anusan swarupa anusandhana attakam. The eight verses of inquiry into the nature of the I, as I have explained. Then, you know, the, the verse itself is in what is called a very nice meter. And it's got a very, very beautiful and famous meter, which is called Bhujanga Prayata. Bhujanga means snake. And... Uh, you know, just like that's why the snake example was invoked, I suppose, right from the start to welcome the Bhujanga Prayata meter. And uh, why is this Bhujanga? What is uh, the, the beauty of this Bhujanga Prayata? Bhujanga Prayata is beautiful because it uh, mimics the undulating movement of a Bhujanga. Bhuja means shoulders. And so the snake is limbless. It doesn't have legs and all. So it moves with the help of its body, shoulders, figuratively speaking. Not that, don't ask me, please point out the shoulders of the snake. No, that's not the point here. It just moves using its, what we would, the, the place where the shoulders would be propelling itself. So it moves like this. You know, there is an undulating motion, which also mimics the movement of a boat on water. Little bobbing up and down, little going this way, that. There is a kind of a lilting, lulling tones, uh, not to put one to sleep, but put to put the ragadveshas, the overpowering uh, uh, pursuits, the desire for this and desire for that, strong prejudices, strong, uh, what is that called, strong uh, preferences. That is what it lulls into a place of sleep. So we can pro, pro, you know, so that the knowledge is assimilated nicely. Then there is also a, another one, another thing that we should know about the Bhujanga Prayata. Bhujanga Prayata is, is uh, you know, is the, um, is the movement of the snake. It is not straightforward. Likewise, Vedanta teaching, you know, the, the way it is assimilated is through stories, through jokes. And, uh, and you know, so it is like this. You have to make a little bit of a digression and then you come back to the topic. Because if I were to keep a straight face, yeah, through tapas, through yajna, through dana, everybody becomes matured. And then after that, you will become ready for this knowledge. You will all, you know, you will all go away. And I, I can't blame you for that. Because I, as I can see from the people, many for many people, it's midnight. And people are still there from America. They have logged on. And so, so you know, so to, to keep it going, the the, the 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 pedagogy the, that we gain from our gurus is, is to make it relevant it has to catch the heart and let the heart blossom if it is not relevant to you why will you listen to it you know yes i may be saying the correct thing i mean yes through tapas through austerities austerities tapas it is correct through yajna, this is the next thing that is there in the verse. Through yajna, you will mature. Yes, correct. Shuddha buddhi, shuddha pure. Buddhi means thinking and discrimination. It's all correct. But if I say it like this, then there, there is an aruchi. Aruchi means there is not a connection. There is not a way of being able to, uh, you know, to, 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 to connect to the text. 
to be able for that text to, to operate upon you, then that undulating movement is necessary. This is the second beauty of the Bhujanga Prayata. Beautiful, absolutely, absolutely beautiful. This is the second thing that is just fantastic. Then the, the third and the final thing about the Bhujanga is very, very interesting because this Bhujanga meter becomes a, um, you know, we have, uh, becomes a stuti. Stuti means uh, a praise. So we have Subramanya Bhujanga. We have verses for uh, 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 Devata Bhagavan in the form of the, 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 the warrior of uh, all uh, Ragadveshas. Um, yeah, we are having a question. When is the, how, where is this PDF available? Uh, you can ask. Uh, I request the moderator. Can you please share this through the text? Uh, because I don't know how to do that. Can you please uh, share actually, that? Actually, yes, yeah. Swaminiji. Um, yeah. That option is not available to me as well. So I'm just trying to find that out. Oh. Um, I will send it in a while. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah uh, that option is available to me. I will send it. Well, okay. One second. Let All me right. just, uh, right. let me just take a little break and send it. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. I just yeah, saw sure. it. Uh, how, how to do that. Let me, I'm putting it in the chat box. So in the same place yeah. where you ask the questions, uh, you know, not questions, chat, uh, you know, in the chat, yeah. I'm trying to put it. Let's see. Uh, sure. Let me just choose everyone. Let's see if it will let me do that. Uh, sure. It is not allowing me to do that. I'm trying. It is showing the plus sign. Uh, okay. Uh, plan B, I will, uh, uh, you, you can do this while I talk. Please put it in sure. Dropbox and share a link so that people link. can download. Sure. Okay, that's plan that. B. Okay. okay, so that, I can also that, do that, but I'd rather be talking rather than doing that. that Thank is. you, Harry. Sure, Thank sure. You. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Yeah. So you, yeah, you will get the text, but right now you are looking at it, so no problem. You can just look at it for now. Uh, uh, so you'll get the, uh, the the text quickly. Don't worry. So then we have, uh, so this is the Bhujanga Prayata meter. And uh, the third thing I was going to say about the Bhujanga Prayata is that it is used for uh, uh, beautiful uh, praise, praiseworthy meter, because it's a meter to praise. We have Shiva Bhujanga, we have um, Subramanya Bhujanga, like that. And even Vedanta texts are in the Bhujanga meter. Another one uh, which is an example is, uh, what is that? Uh, Hasta Malakiyam. Uh, uh, you know, same kind of a meter. Very beautiful meter. And so, the, therefore, this is suited, there is a, the precedent of having this for uh, Vedanta, uh, uh, Vedanta talks, uh, Vedanta verses as well. So, then that is the thing. And then, you know, in terms of categorization of this text, it is also important to mention something else uh, that this uh, usually we have um, Prakarana Granthas. We, it is divided into Prakarana Granthas, Manana Granthas and Nididhyasana, Nididhyasana Granthas. So what is Prakarana Grantha? Prakarana Grantha is a copycat of the Upanishad, a manuscript that is a copycat of the Upanishad. It unfolds the vision. It unfolds the method to get this vision. It unfolds what to do in order to qualify for understanding this vision. And it gives the phala of this vision, the, the, the fruits of what will happen if you gain this vision. And what will happen if you gain this vision? You know, you'll be free. You will no longer feel like you, you have to be uh, in a state of enslavement and you don't have to do that you don't have to you know you don't have to worry about anything you can be free and you don't have to want anything at all it's a place of non-wanting and limitless happiness that is the phala so this is called prakarana grantha systematically it will unfold and fill in to the upanishads because the upanishad is a lady of few words she doesn't say much she, the, the Prakarana Grantha will fill in the blanks and take you to uh, give, flesh it out. 
Then there are certain other granthas called manana granthas, which are basically needed. Uh, which are which are basically needed. Uh, the, they don't. Uh, the, the, their purport is not to unfold the knowledge systematically. Their uh, their purpose is to look at the um, is to look at the um, at the teaching and then uh, remove whatever doubts you may have. Whether those doubts are, uh, you know, whether about what I'm studying or how I can be Brahman or what is this all about, that is the, that is the thing. And then uh, an example of a Manana Grantha is a very highly regarded uh, work called Advaita Makaranda. Makaranda Poland, the Poland of non-duality. The idea is we are all bees humming towards the flower which is having the Poland of non-duality to collect it and spread it everywhere. So that is a that is a uh, typical Mananak Grantha. And then uh, what is that? What does the Mananak Grantha do? The Mananak Grantha is the, uh, uh, you know, the Mananak Grantha. What does it do? The Mananak Grantha uh, gives the reasonings why you are Brahman. So in this in this Advaita Makaranda, first uh, first is a premise, and then. Uh, the, then the second line is the reasoning why this premise works or doesn't work. Ahamasmi sadabhami kada chinnaham apriyah brahmaivaham atas siddham satchidananda lakshanam. So the, 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 the last line says brahmaivaham atas siddham. Now it is established that I am Brahman. Why? I am. I know I am. Ahamasmi sadabhami. I am aware of my existence. And never am I an object of self-dislike. I'm not an object of self-dislike. Meaning what? I am not an object of self-loath. Even if I have tons of self-loath, I am not coming in that spell. Why? Because I'm waiting for that self-loath to go. I have self-loath, yes. I have self-critique, yes. But I hate the fact that I have self-loath. Means what? I have self-love. That is what it is. That is what it is. It's very beautiful. And so this is the uh, uh, this is why the, uh, the this this bhujanga meter works very well. And then so this prakarana grantha, manana grantha. Then there is nididhyasana grantha. Nididhyasana grantha means a manuscript uh, that uh, is not really unfolding the knowledge, but is a restatement of the vision of the Upanishad. Because I know I am Brahman, but I have viparita buddhi. Viparita buddhi means I still get angry, I still get upset, I still have smallness. I, I know I am Brahman, but I don't behave like Brahman. <laughs> and for that it is Nididhyasana Grantha. Now if we look at this text and the 8 verses, 8-9 eight, verses of this text, we, we are in a spin. Why? Because this is a cuspid octet. octet. Kaspid means it's neither a Prakarana Grantha, nor is it a Manana Grantha, nor is it a Nididhyasana Grantha. Why? Because the author, some Shankaracharya or the other, it is attributed to Shankaracharya because that was the custom in the olden days. So the author wanted to keep you on your feet so that you will pay attention. If supposing if it was a pra pra Prakarana Grantha, the ahankara, the jaded, faded jiva. What will the jaded, faded jiva say? The jaded, faded jiva will say, ah, I know this. Ah, this is me kya hai? Kuch nahi hai. This is what? This is the prakarna grantha. Been there, done that. And then you'll stop paying attention. And if you are told it's a manana grantha, yeah, 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 I have done enough mananam. You know, been there, done that. You know, this is a jaded feeling. I don't need Nididhyasana, I have knowledge, okay, go. This is how it is. So this keeps you on your toes. You know, oh, the first two paragraph, the first two stanza, Prakarna Grantha. Then even in that first stanza, the last line is a Nididhyasana and the, you know, the second line is, 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 a, is Mananam, like this it will be. It just keeps you on your toes. 
and that is exactly where we where we want you to be. <laughs> yeah, um, Harry, somebody is raising the hand. I'm not sure why. If it's a, I just request everybody. If it's an urgent request, if there's something you cannot hear or something, then only raise your hand. Otherwise, we'll have some question period at the end. You can uh, you can ask. Okay, yeah. So. Uh, so maybe it's an accident. I don't know. Sometimes you press something and the hand gets raised. All right. So with these words, let us chant the, the, the first stanza and then see where to go from there. Tapo yajna dana di bhishuddha buddhihi Virakto nripadev padetu chha buddhya Parityajya sarvam yadapnoti tatvam Parabbaram Brahmanityam Tadevaham Asmi Tapo Yagna Dana Di Bhishuddha Buddhihi Virakto Nripadev Pade Tucha Buddhya Parityajya Sarmam Yadapno Titatvam Param Brahmanityam Tadevaham Asmi you can see the snake and the boat here. Yeah, you can see that in how it is there. There are many ways to chant it, but I chose the simplest tune so that we can uh, uh, emulate and enjoy also. And then you can just sort of see how the snake is moving here and very nice. And so let us look at the, 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 uh, the, the meaning. Tapaha, yag, tapascha, yagnyascha. Dana di bhihi, dana di scha, dana, uh, dana di scha, then uh, taihi, dana di bhihi, tapo yagna dana di bhihi. Third case plural, which means through tapas, and we'll see what that means, through yagna, second, and through dana, adipadat, ad other, etc. You know, supposing if I say hat, coat, etc., then you include the umbrella also even though it's not mentioned. Okay, so like that. Adipadat, we have, you know, other things which we will see. Then, uh, this is an instrumental case, which means because of this, because of something called tapas, because of something called yajna, because of something called dana, etc., what happens? Shuddha buddhi comes. Shuddha buddhi. Buddhi means my thinking, my intellect, my mental infrastructure. <laughs> that is what, that is what is Shuddha Buddhi. And that is what is, the, the, that, that is what comes. And this is the, this, this is exactly what comes. And so, the Tapo Yajna Dana Dibhi Shuddha Buddhi. So, there is a cause effect, a, a Karya Karana connection. So, the karya, the effect is Shuddha Buddhi and let we will see what that is and for getting a Buddhi that is uncluttered. I would not like to uh, define uh, Shuddha here as pure even though that is the meaning because otherwise we don't want one more complex saying I have impure mind. No. <laughs> I have impure buddhi, oh no. Already the life is full of complexes. Shuddha buddhi here means an uncluttered buddhi. Uncluttered. Just like, you know, let's say uh, you have not cleaned the house in a long time. Maybe a week or 10 days. All the things are lying everywhere. The kitchen is a mess. The living room is a mess. The bedroom is a mess. Everything is a mess. Then suddenly you get a phone call. Why do you get a phone call? Because now the pandemic is at low levels. People have started to visit each other. Before you could live like a pig and nobody knew. But now uh, somebody calls and says, I'm on my way. I'm going to pass through your house. I'm visiting. And so what do you do? You quickly just take everything that is there and whatever cupboard is at hand, you shove it in that cupboard and with great difficulty, you call your significant other also, both of you put the weight on the cupboard and close it off. All right? In the hope that the visitor will not open it or you don't open, need to open it in front of the visitor. So if the buddhi is like this over stuffed closet with all kinds of things that were lying around, what kinds of things? Objects of desire. 
of preoccupation. I have to do this. Somebody will be mad. Okay, let them be mad. Why should you have to do this? No, no. If they are mad, that means they will be angry with me. Let them be angry, Baba. What is wrong with you? Why should you worry? No, <laughs> because if they are angry with me, means they will not validate me. They will be upset with me. I, I want the whole world to love me. Why? Because I don't love myself. Simple. That's all. It all goes back to the I. Vedanta is an inside job real. We have to steal away the doubt and the despair. It's an inside job. We, I have always said this. And so therefore, the you know, I, I want to, I want to, I want this. I want this right now. And how to do this right now? How to do this right now means, you know, this is, uh, I can't, I, I, I am bound to, to in my actions. I am bound by my desires. I am bound by my reactions. Because I didn't get my way, I got angry. So the buddhi is cluttered with pursuits. Most of them needless. Oh, what do you mean needless? You can sit there wearing orange and say, Oh, you don't need to pay the bills. What do you mean? I need to pay my bills. <laughs> I need to do this. I need to work. I need to get some kind of a thing. Well, you know, yes, we are not talking of that. Needless pursuits are those which you don't need to do. Which is just based on some kind of an ego trip or fear of displeasing others or fear of not getting something in life. That's what it is. So just like that closet which just before the guest came, you know, you just stuff it and put it there. Everyone's buddhi and the guest is, you know, basically Vedanta. So before the Vedanta is assured and given a place of a respectful guest in one's life, the buddhi is full of all kinds of clutter. All kinds of clutter. Needless things are there. The obligations. And I have to do this, otherwise people won't like me. People will be mad at me. What will people think? In India, I don't know. In America, they don't bother so much about what people think. But in India, this is the main disease. What will people think it is? This is what it is. Everybody, what will people think? Oh, if I do this. And I tell you this, many people don't come to many Vedanta classes because of this. <laughs> oh, whole weekend, what will people think? <laughs> for four hours every day, <laughs> what will people think? Eight hours, OMG, what will people think? <laughs> and this is a disease. What will people think it is? That is the, that is the disease, that is the, you know, of, of uh, this is the symptom of samsara. This is the samsara itself is a symptom of Atma Ajnanam, the disease called Atma Ajnanam. So therefore the buddhi is not Shuddha. Means, Shuddha means it is not uncluttered enough for me to have a little more lofty set of thoughts. How come I am very calm when I am in nature? And how come when I am surrounded by people I am agitated? Those are lofty thoughts. Those are, there is no time for introspection. When the buddhi is cluttered, there is no time for Bhagavan. Why? Because there is there's only space to perhaps uh, sing some longing songs. Darshan kab doge? When will you give me darshan? Oh Lord, oh Goddess. Aankh micholi mat khelo. Don't play hide and seek with me and show me where you are. And Bhagavan, I tell you, Bhagavan is needing a cough drop because Bhagavan is hoarse saying I am right here <laughs> in your buddhi as your buddhi I am right here Lord Hari Lord Krishna is saying that I am right here as your buddhi look but I can't look why because there is a forest of desires it is cluttered by objects of wants objects of don't wants and somehow I have to clean the buddhi out it's very simple to clean the closet. You have to throw things out because you have amassed too many things. You, you, that, that's why the, it is not fitting in the closet. That's why your house looks like a pig's tie. That, that you have to get rid of a few things. Like last month's newspaper and all these things. You have to get rid of all that. That's easy to figure out. Oh, this needs to go. This needs to stay. Sometimes it is easy, okay? Sometimes it's not. Because what is happening in the buddhi spills over to one's life. As within... So without.
but generally speaking if one you know if one is objective enough then you know okay these are things that don't belong i have to get rid of these things they have no place in my life harder it is because the buddhi is sukshma and the buddhi with the help of the ahankara catches clings on to those objects people situations and events which it does not need it, it, which it thinks it to be itself it, it clings on to wrong notions wrong ideas wrong desires and as a result it it becomes subject to sorrow pain and unfulfillment so outside it's very easy i know how to clean i know how to do you know i need soap i need water i need a dustbin and i put everything into the dustbin and then throw it out internally what is the soap <laughs> what is the water this is what it is tapas is the soap Yajna is the water. Dana is the cleaning cloth that wipes up all the soapy water and all the dirt. That is what it is. How is tapas the soap? Just what does the soap do? The soap cuts into the grime. And similarly, tapas here, this, 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 this little uh, compound here, tapo yajna dana di bihi, this, this little compound of these three words are borrowed from the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. Yajnena danena tapasa vividishanti brahmanaha. There is a uh, verse, there is a stanza in the, uh, a, there, there is a vakya in the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, there is a vakya yajnena danena tapasa vividishanti Brahmanaha. Brahmanaha means people who are uh, uh, people who are interested in knowing Brahman. Brahmani charitum shilam asya asti ti brahmana. People who want to be uh, immersed in Brahman, what do they do? They they get to the place of self. Uh, uh, you know they purify their buddhi. How do they purify their buddhi? They purify their buddhi by tapas. Tapas means, you know, it's some kind of uh, uh, austerities. A, a, a religious or spiritual, I, I'd rather like to call it spiritual practices because, you know, it's not really religious. It goes across the board. All religions have fasting. You see, in the month of Ramadan, one month fasting, so much in Islam. In Christianity also there is fasting. In, in the Hindu Dharma, there is lot of fasting. Every, you know, every Ekadashi, every, you know, every 11th day uh, uh, of the waning and the waxing moon. So you fast. And then you fast on Amavasya also. Then again on the new moon days, so already four fasts a month. And then uh, if you look at your horror scope. <laughs> so, if you look at your horoscope, then the astrologers and gurus will tell you, your guru is very weak, your shukra is weak. So, then Thursday, Friday, one, one meal you skip. So, already you have so many fasts in a month. Then there will be other things like Pitra Paksha. All these things come that is also more fast, fast, fast. So, you know, so, so there is, this, is, this is a form of a, a spiritual, religious austerity. Then if you ask the question, what is happening as a result of this fast? Nothing is happening, I feel. I'm getting just hungrier. Well, no. That kind of an addiction to food is going. I eat in order to live uh, rather than live in order to eat. <laughs> this is the beauty of the fast. This is the beauty of the spiritual austerity called fasting. There should be an objective relationship with the food. Hunger pangs given by Bhagavan, food given by Bhagavan, and the two should meet and must meet. And I should eat when I am hungry. And not because I am bored, not because I am sad, not because I, I like this one thing and so I will keep eating it until, you know, until the stomach explodes. Or until I need to spend the next three days in the bathroom. You know, if you if you like jalebis and you eat a whole tokri, a basket full of jalebis, then, you know, you are out of commission for three days afterwards. <laughs> so, usually, there is uh, the, the raga dveshas express themselves. Ragas, strong prejudices. Dveshas, strong, uh, what is that called? Um, uh, 
sorry, strong preferences, raga, strong prejudices, dvesha. And so they express themselves in the form of severe likes and dislikes. And food is a very common way because one, especially in Kali Yuga right now, and especially after the pandemic where everybody is working from home, half the people are still working from home. That means what? You are sitting in one room, the kitchen is right next door. <laughs> you can go whenever you want and graze and whenever you want, you can eat. So the discipline, at least when you went to the office, 9 to 5, 8 to 3, whatever it was, the timings, that, that much time there was no eating, there was, so there was a tea break, there was a lunch break, it was actually good. But now one has lost that objectivity. In Kali Yuga itself, one has lost the objectivity because we no longer eat with the seasons. This is an ecological travesty that we don't eat with the seasons. You know, in India, just yesterday, day before yesterday, I was, I was on my walk in the evening and then I saw one man selling mangoes. I even said, what is this? How can you have mangoes in the middle of November? What is wrong with this world? No, no, no. We, we are incubating it and doing this, some kind of a greenhouse and this farm and everything. You know, this is the kind of a thing. So we don't eat seasonally and we no longer eat, generally speaking, when we are hungry. And food is not so much for hunger. Food is a social event, which is nothing wrong. But then, you know, you, you when you, um, the, the researchers tell us that when you eat at a restaurant, you eat more because you are around more people and everything and there is more of a, more goes in. And you can't control how much oil is there, how much salt is there. So it's worse for you. This is the kind of a thing that, that the researchers talk about. So with regard to eating, this is called tapas. There is a discipline with regard to eating. And then the life of a Vaidika in the Vedic tradition, there the whole life is a full, the life itself is tapas. You can't get up at noon. Why? Because you have to do yajna in the morning. That is how it is connected to yajna there. You can't just get up whenever you feel like. You can't just do whatever you feel like. There are duties. So you see, I'm, I'm changing the tone of my life from keeping myself wedded to what I want to do as I like to do. From there, I am changing my life by putting it on a diet of uh, not, uh, uh, not what I want to, not a diet of ragadveshas, but a diet of duties. What is it that I'm supposed to do? And when you ask that question, there is many things you're supposed to do. Your birth is not an accident. You are plugged into this universe. You are here. You have a role. You have to do certain things. And so those duties are very, 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 very important. So the tapas becomes a duty for the one who wants Shuddha Buddhi. So all kinds of religion. So like having a disciplined life. I just, you know, I have certain... Discipline means what? Dharma. So my life is in tandem with the universal matrix of norms called dharma. This is the disciplined life. And that disciplined life is what is needed to wear out the for the raga and the dvesha to wear out their welcome. They should feel neglected. They should feel unwanted. They should feel like nobody is wanting them at all. And that is how I have to treat them. And when I treat them like that, then what happens? Then the then there is space, then the clutter in the buddhi, the constantly being obsessed with food or with friends or with some video games or the internet. Some of the obsessions are very, very subtle. Some people want to be all the time on the internet, all the time. And then the, this is this is all this has to go. And when this goes, then there is space for something else to come. And what is that something else? The contemplation, which is mentioned in the last line, Param Brahma Nityam, Nityam Param Brahma Tadeva, the, that alone I am. I am Brahman, I am one with the cause of the universe. I am that Bhagavan I seek. That, of course, we'll have to unfold a little more, but just, just now, just to connect the lines together. I am that which I, I seek. I am that which I want to be. 
I am that limitless, sentient cause of the universe. How will you understand this if there is no space in the life? If you are constantly uh, pursuing the finite, where is the space for the infinite? There is no space to pursue the infinite because the quest itself has become <laughs> infinite. I am infinitely obsessed with the finite. And when I catch a hold of an finite object, then that is my, I feel it is my ticket to infinity. What do I do? I get hold of the, I grasp at the finite and try to make it infinite. This is the travesty of the universe. This starting with this body. I know this body is finite, but then what? I want to make it infinite. That's what keeps all the plastic surgeons in, uh, in, in a job, in, in places like Florida and all. That's what it is, because everybody wants the wrinkles gone. Everybody wants all the sags and the bags in the body gone. Everybody wants to look like they are 40 when they are 80. They want to look like 20 when they are 40. And it goes on and on. The body will sag naturally. And there will be bags under the eyes naturally. You're growing older, they, they, they will be growing older. You are not growing older, the body is growing older, that is the point. But in the obsession to fix this body, you have compromised you. Where is the you? That, that, that you is, is not an object, that the subject is not in focus. Uh, because you are distracted by the finite, thinking that to be yourself, there is a mad rush to take care of the body. There is a mad rush to take care of the mind. By eating all kinds of berries, they have found out that the berries are very good for mind. You know, and then certain herbs uh, like, uh, what is that called, Brahmi and all that. Brahmi, herb, all these things very good for the mind. So I want to keep the mind. And then some games, uh, number games, like Sudoku, if I play, I won't have dementia. All these things people think. I mean, nothing wrong in trying to keep the mind sharp and to keep the body fit. But this over-obsession is what we are talking about here. Not, uh, you know, not, not that which is done within bounds. Here, that which has become, that, that has become boundless. How do we know? Because there is even a, even a shop called Body Shop. <laughs> there is a shop called Body Shop. <laughs> which will keep the body, you know, all kinds of potions and lotions everywhere, different, different colors. And then you go there and they'll say, oh, your skin is like this. You need this. You need that. You need this. All the, the whole focus is on the finite and thinking because I don't know the infinite and I mistake the finite to be the infinite. And I, you know, and I catch hold of the finite and then try to make it infinite and one whole lifetime gone. Another lifetime gone, third lifetime gone, this is how it is. Infinitely sad, infinitely unhappy. To reverse that, I have to stop pursuing the finite. Stop pursuing the finite. That's what it is. So, the, and then if I stop pursuing the finite, what to do? You know, what to do? You have to pursue the infinite. How to pursue the infinite? Before that, I don't even like the infinite because I don't know the infinite. It's boring. You just take some, uh, you know, you go to a mall and you go to the mall and uh, distribute some leaflets on Vedanta. Okay, this is just a joke. You just go to a mall and try this experiment. You, you say, okay, please join the next weekend with wisdom. And this is what it is. And this is what the speaker will be talking about. <laughs> Who will come from there? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> Why? There is no preparation. No preparation. No tapas has been done. And when you put the body and the mind on a disciplined life, a disciplined life is a dharmic life. And why is the dharmic life important? The dharmic life is important because in our tradition, dharma is a manifestation of Ishvara, a manifestation of God, not just a mandate of God. It's not a mandate of God, it's a manifestation. The closer I am to doing the right thing at all times, that means what? That means the closer I am to Bhagavan, the cause of the universe. Less conflicted, less disconnected, less alienated. Try it. That's what it is. So why is dharma important? Because 
there is a tug of war between the asuras and the and the devas devas means those uh, those tendencies within me that naturally are law abiding that naturally want to be considerate of others that naturally want to just be in 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 tandem with what is right what is correct what is appropriate in every situation and what are the asuras those ragadveshas that have been co-opted uh, into going rogue and saying <laughs> rakshasas demons in is saying come on so what cut a corner here so what nobody will know nobody will know you know i was giving the example the other day in india you go and then you know in the crowded marketplace you know poor things all the the the, the municipal law uh, bodies uh, they have to put a sticker a big poster saying please do not spit here because here we have this problem of chewing this tobacco and uh, and betel leaf and little lime and then uh, it turns the mouth red and it causes a lot of saliva to come so everywhere you have red spit and so they will put a bowl please don't spit here a poster and one time i again on my walk i noticed that the, i could not even i could barely read the poster because it was it was full of spit this is what it is and then so if, if somebody says oh somebody other people have already spat on it so therefore i will spit that's not that is not dharma that is not dharma dharma means you have to be uncomfortable that which makes you uncomfortable when you follow it at least in the beginning then you know you are in 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 line with it because that leads us to the next word yagna yagna means sacrifice here it literally means in the ancient times it literally meant fire ritual but metaphorically and allegorically it means sacrifice fire sacrifice we say why is it sacrifice because to set up that whole thing is not easy pandits need to be invited money has to be collected and paid to them the senior most gets the lot and all these things you know that that is all that dakshina has to be given all the people who come have to be given a gift and then you have to make the fire pit properly everything has to be proper all the offerings at the at the correct time you have to invite the people you have to make them feel good you have to uh, organize food for them because uh, yagna without food is unheard of food should be there and you you feed the people then send them off respectfully and with a lot of love it takes a lot of money it takes a lot of work one is you know you cannot be thinking when will i have the food i'm only feeding other people you cannot even that my that thought will not even cross your mind you know why because there is no time you are busy attending to people that is why it is called sacrifice so here nowadays nobody is very few people are doing yagna it happens in temples in a very few nitya agnihotris the the nitya karmis are very few so therefore we have to take it metaphorically uh, also sacrifice means what i sacrifice the ragadveshas in order to give happiness to somebody else i be why because i can because i can so let's say you sit down after a long days of work you have saved yourself a piece of chocolate cake you are dying for it you are finally you feel okay i've done everything i've put everything I'm, else away this is my reward i have worked all day you're about to cut into it and then a friend comes the friend says cake oh my god i really want it then what what do you do then you know and you say i haven't had anything all day long okay please have it or at least with great reluctance you cut it in half and then you you give them even while you are lamenting inside you let them have half you know it's a small piece but you let them have half okay theek hai you can also yeah, eat this and it makes you even though you are happy to share it makes you a little uncomfortable oh why this fellow had to come right now why could he not come 10 minutes later when i would have finished it and so that little regret that is a cause for self growth that causes a little decluttering because in relationship to that object of delight i am free there is a connection between giving that's another mean of, meaning of yagna and dana dana means giving so there is a connection between giving and growing 
the more you give, the more you grow. That's how it is. You grow. And in fact, it is there in the body language of everybody. So you, you look at the body language of a philanthropist who is saying, today at this ceremony, at this function, I am giving $1 million to, to this particular charity which has done such a wonderful job. And the giver stands straight, erect and happy, confident. But if you are always begging, you, you look at the demeanor of the beggar, helpless, victimized, small, oh, please give me, please don't scold me, please, please, please give me this, give me this, give me this. That is how it is. So the, 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 the giver, one needs to grow from being a constant receiver to a giver. That is the, the relative goal of life. The absolute goal is that this kind of a growth is going to lead you to, to this knowledge, to desire this knowledge and to prepare for this knowledge. It's really amazing. But I grow by becoming uncomfortable. I learn to walk in these new shoes which may pinch in the beginning, but after that they become like second uh, feet. It's like I'm walking bare feet, bare, bare uh, foot. I'm walking. Why? Because I'm used to the, the, the footwear. It has become comfortable. But before, the, the, yeah, the, the, the person who was, uh, who was used to, accustomed to doing however they liked, whatever they liked, and then they, you know, they did anyhow, anytime, whatever it is. And whatever they did, they are now put on a diet of discipline and then giving dana, and then what else? You know, yajna, sacrifice. And, and that leads to growth. The third one is dana. Dana means, you know, as I said, giving, reaching out actions. It can be about donations, but it need not be about money. It need not be about money. It can be, but it need not be about money. And it, 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 is, it is very, very important to understand this because there are many ways you can give yourself. Sometimes just a smile. Sometimes just a, a, a kind look. Sometimes the, whatever you can contribute physically, emotional, sitting with somebody, listening to them. All this. All this is just very, 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 very nice it's very akin it's very in uh, in keeping with this uh, uh, with this growth so reaching out actions making the space in my life not to just be you know have this tunnel vision of just seeing what i want and how i want to accomplish what i want but being able to look around somebody is in need somebody is is in despair and i can help i'm in a position to help I can lift them up a little bit. I can spend time with them. I can uh, I can counsel them. I can you know I can invite them for a meal. Whatever it takes, I'm able to do. This is adi. Adi means whatever it takes. Whatever else that's not been covered by these words. And then what you know, dana uh, adi Then you find that there is space. Suddenly, while there is emotional maturity, meaning. I grow from being a reactive person to a responsive person. A reactive person is the one who constantly reacts to all kinds of situations. You know, the reacts means, oh, I didn't want this. I, you know, oh, how could you do this to me? And what is this? What do you mean you're a friend? You keep canceling the, the times that we have together. Last minute you cancel and you go do something else. And, you know, this is reactivity. A one step, you know, outburst without really, without really stepping back and looking at the situation. So from that, being that kind of an offensive, defensive person, I grow into an accommodative person. That is what is called the one who is endowed with Shuddha Buddhi. And that is the person who doesn't react. Who, who responds to the situation no, and the person not to the hurt. I may be hurt. You know, supposing somebody says, oh, I'm going to visit you at 5 o'clock and they never come, they never call. I may be offended. I may be upset. But then the next thought would be to, you know, maybe the next thought 
for somebody it would be i'm going to call them and give them a piece of my mind <laughs> but then you don't touch the dial you don't touch the phone and then you say maybe they had a reason then what happens the accommodation grows oh what could be the reason maybe they are not well maybe they are not you know in the thing then something happened then you call them what happened yes yes i remember i had to do this but my child went for an exam and forgot something i had to run you know to the school and give them that thing they needed for their exam oh okay that is totally all your anger goes you see you you are you, you being a reasonable person you understand yes there was some reason but supposing the friend just flaked off forgot <laughs> and then oh were we going to get together i didn't remember then also let us say you know because of yagna dana tapas not just one time but a lifetime of practice of that you have gained accommodation you will say it doesn't matter it is okay no but why should i say it is okay why not get angry okay you can get angry it is within your rights to get angry what will happen after you get angry can that 5 o'clock of yesterday when they ghosted you when they stood you up can that <laughs> can that be reproduced no yes they can make another time yes they can you know you can do that another time but it that, that that time will not come back what is the use of getting angry either the friend is a responsible friend or the friend is a flake so you cannot make the flake into a non flake because that's how the person is for now until they they have to change you cannot change them so you have two choices oh but they are so good then if you think that they are wonderful to you 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 connect to those aspects of the friendship that are wonderful to you and let go of those that uh, you know the flaky nature don't put yourself in harm's way you have a phone relationship don't ever say let's get together let's go to this cafe let's have a time together don't do that anymore leave them free to be who they are have a phone relationship at some point they are themselves going to miss you and they are going to say i want to come to your house tomorrow night and then they may come you let them be this is what is shuddha buddhi and this is how it is gained and then what does this shuddha buddhi looks like the shuddha buddhi translates into virakti why shuddha buddhi is a short form for viveka discrimination between what i want and what i don't want and what is permanent and what is temporary what is temporary is not what i want what is permanent is what i want nitya nitya vastu viveka this is shuddha buddhi shuddha buddhi means this okay this is shuddha buddhi then what then we have to see that uh, you know when i know that uh, this is not what i want the next thing to do is to drop what i don't want so that i can pursue what i want simple this is called vairagya and the feminine form of it is virakti same vairagya masculine virakti uh, you know uh, vairagya neuter i think yeah and then uh, virakti the same thing in uh, feminine viraga masculine same you know same uh, root raj raj to connect we raj disconnect or or not to remain aloof from what from the various preoccupations that make my days miserable that makes my life miserable because i cannot gain what i want and whatever i don't want i get in in two two helpings double helpings so this is the next word here virakti so this this virakti is is important virak virakti and then virakta describes the person so the the person who is shuddha buddhi uh, the person who who who, ha, who gains shuddha buddhi becomes virakta becomes virakta means becomes free becomes free of what 
तुच्छ बुद्धि तुच्छ बुद्धि इज अगेन अ वेरी ब्यूटिफुल दिस थिंग तुच्छ मीन्स निम्ना निम्ना मीन्स वॉट इज दैट लो I am no longer interested in the low-hanging fruit of the objects of desires. I am no longer interested in that. Why should I be? Why should I bother? I am not interested in any of these things at all. And because my sights are on gaining the truth of myself, for which I have become qualified through tapas and whatever it means, and uh, you know all the disciplines, etc. through yagna through dana which together mean a life of karma yoga a life that is dedicated to self growth rather than the fulfillment of of the objects of desires because i have the viveka that these desires are very ephemeral they come and go and the objects are finite and in fact after gaining the objects the desire morphs into the desire for something else so i am not happy even after i have what i want so therefore what this these objects are not what i want what i want is the subject not the object that subject which is i which is equated in the shastra to bhagavan that bhagavan that object of my devotion that uh, free person that contented person is who i want myself as bhagavan myself as limitless this is this understanding is called viraga uh, sorry viveka and that comes as a result of the religious and spiritual disciplines of leading a disciplined life and then that viveka leads to vairagya here in the second line so this virakta uh, virakti hi and how does this virakti come by cultivating tuchha buddhi tuchha buddhi simply means the sentence i i had a, i have a sentence a new mantra it does not matter oh that's the mantra yes when do i say it all the time <laughs> when somebody is angry at you say it does not matter it does not matter it does not matter oh but it's important it matters somebody my my reputation is on the line it matters it really does not matter why because look in the look in the realm of politics Uh, the 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 uh, the uh, general memory of the people is so short the collective memory is so short no i know i haven't done anything wrong okay then why are you scared somebody is thinking bad of me let them you know you have a, you, your heart is clear you have shuddha buddhi therefore what have tuchha buddhi to people who are having all kinds of uh, you know all kinds of uh, feelings about you or thoughts about you it does not matter and so you know it, even if you are not able to say it does not matter say what the japanese zen monk said in in a similar situation is that so oh is it like this is and that's a very very wonderful story he lived in the hills somewhere a zen monk and he had a young girl who used to come and clean his uh, uh kutia and he used to cook for him and give him some fruits and everything and then the the she gets pregnant and everybody blames the mom everybody says oh it's this fellow and then all the people in the village used to go to the mountain and then they they used to go to he lived on a hill they used to go there and then bow and then be so whatever then they came with sticks and stones and beat him to a pulp you've spoiled this girl's life and all he said is is that so that's all he said when the baby was born and the villagers came again and just handed this crying infant to the monk and said you take care of it why should she, her life be spoiled this way at least she can we can marry her off this is ancient japan okay you are not modern japan so we can marry her off to somebody else and she can have a life you take care of it it's your baby why should you get away freely and have this wear these robes and call yourself a monk and have this respectable life this is your baby take care of it and again the monk said is that so 
Then the monk found, found no bhiksha came, nothing came. He had to go down and then beg at people's houses. He could not beg at a single house in the village because all the doors were shut and stones would come out instead of food. So he had to walk to the next village and beg for some milk for the baby and something to sustain himself. Few months went like that. Then the villagers came again, shamefaced, carrying baskets of fruits, sweets, nuts and everything. And then the girl was too scared to confess that she was in love with a lad in the next village because there was some feud between the families. And then they, 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 brought, then they said, okay, please give the baby back. It is not yours. And please bless them. We are getting them married. And then again he said, is that so? And blessed them. And this, you know, uh, when we see this story, we say, oh, how can I behave like this? That was that was a monk. Yes, you know, <laughs> that is how, that is, that is the, that is everyone's collective destiny in the Hindu dharma. In the Hindu dharma, the collective destiny of everyone is to grow, to be a sannyasi. That is why it is the last ashrama. It is the last thing that you need. That is what it is. It is not like you, you, you know, you see, you, you say, oh, 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 you know, I, I can be whoever I want and I can just uh, continue with my raga and dveshas, no? That is not how it is. It is your destiny to grow into an accommodative person, impervious and totally thick-skinned to bouquets and brickbats, to use a cliché. Whether people are praising you or whether people are deriding you, you have such a strong understanding of who you are that you are unshaken by other people. Uh, other people do not have an effect on you. And you know that is so freeing because other, when the other people don't have an effect on you, you know what happens? You are free to enjoy them however they are. You no longer need to be helpless and powerless in relation to them. Neither do you need to make them and manipulate them into fulfilling your desire for validation. That's why you can be surrounded by people, all kinds of people, and you can just enjoy them. That is sainthood. Sainthood in the Hindu dharma is not something given by some Vatican or some kind of a, you know, church body or some authority where after death, the you know, you're getting a, 400 years after the death, you get a little piece of paper, so and so was a saint. No, that is the living truth of who you are. That saintliness is already you. That saint is who you already are. It has to be discovered. It has to be understood. It has to be lived. This is the phala of Vedanta Shastra. Where you are not, uh, you are even by the worst of situations and the worst of people, you are not affected. You are not affected at all because everything is a, 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 a an extension of you, you know. But how to get there? How to get there? Point number one, very nicely given, Shuddha Buddhi. Point number two, that is Viveka. Point number two, Vairagya here. Second one, you know, have Tuchha Buddhi, opposite of, you know, opposite of a cluttered Buddhi. Have a Buddhi that disregards, that is aloof to things in life. Let go. There is an expression, let go, let God. Here, let go so that the window to the self opens. So the door to the self opens when you let go of clutching. You know, the clutching is very, very, uh, you know, this uh, uh, is, is very, very, uh, the unclutching is important. When one is born, when a baby is born, it is, you see, like it's like this. The fists are like this. <laughs> But then when the person dies, it's all open. That should be the figurative journey in life. One comes to the world with a feeling of insecurity and the karma from previous lives. And then one grows with the help of this tapas, yajna, dana, etc. One go, grows to be a secure person and that secure person becomes ready for this knowledge. And becoming ready for this knowledge is not a small thing. Already one is saintly. A saintly person is, a, is interested in this knowledge. Already one is a very, very dharmic person who comes to the knowledge. And then 
dis learns to disregard notions, things, objects, and people, the clinging is disregarded. This is tuchha buddhi. Tuchha buddhi for what? Nripadehe padehe. See, in the ancient times, the biggest thing you could become was a king, okay? So, Nripa is king. Nripadi means like kingly positions, top position. I want to be like uh, whoever is the richest person now, this uh, Indian man or whatever it is now. And uh, these Adanis and all these, you know, people, I want to be like that. I want to be like Bezos, the Amazon owner. I want to be like that. That is also this, <laughs> that is also some kind of a Adhipatya, power, Dripatva. Everybody wants power. And if you settle for the local power, that power which is yourself is, is denied to you because you have settled for something so small and you are so worried about keeping, you know, keeping on either pursuing it or having gained it just to keeping on hanging on to it. So that there, and that power of being a king is a power that is fraught with desire on one side and fear on the other side. The desire to keep it going is, is propelling you to just keep cutting corners and annexing other kingdoms, etc., becoming Hitler. And then the fear of losing it is, is again leading you to adharma. These, are, these desires are called patakas. They, they lead you to, to, to a life of derailment. Pataka means fall. Derailment from this tapas, yajna, jnana, dana, etc. So instead of atma jnanam, you are just worshipping atma ajnanam. If you don't have tuchha buddhi, if you don't learn to be indifferent to power, pelf, position, bhoga, um, objects of enjoyment or consumption, addiction, objects of addiction, all these things if you don't become averse to, you have to develop an aversion. Aparokshana Bhuti says this, you know, you have to, you have to develop aversion like, uh, you know, like a crow dropping, you know, you're, uh, you know, you're unsuspectingly going under a, under a tree and the crow suddenly decides to go where on you on your shoulder just as you are going for a uh, you know important uh, 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 appointment interview and you say gee what is this terrible and until you go home and until you wash this off or change your clothes you don't feel good you have an aversion to crow droppings so make the desire for fame, name, as good as a crow dropping. Why? Because it's as good as excrement. It's as good as the remnant of, of, of Brahman, really. It is, you know, it is, it is not the, it is not the ultimate. It is not infinite. It is very, very finite. It's a waste product of the Jagat in a way is a waste as though waste product of Bhagavan. Like that you start seeing it. You see, you have Vairagya. That is what it is. Waste product means it's, you don't need to develop disgust. But you need to develop aversion or aloofness. That's what it is. Until you see it all as Bhagavan. Then it doesn't matter. Then you can you are in love with the whole universe, but this is a practice. This is not the be uh, the the end stage. The practice is this that the the practice is that you you uh, school yourself to to have what is that you know to to have this dridata to not swerve from the pursuit of the I from qualifying to gain this knowledge. From the discipline you know, and from minimizing the ragadveshas, managing the ragadveshas, not letting them get to you, and uh, being having some freedom with them in in relation to them, and you you and developing an aversion uh, to even the biggest thing that's offered on a platter. You know, some many people will come and offer you things, and in accepting those things, they you know mind you. Be sure that you're not getting to a life of enslavement to the aforementioned people. There is no such thing somebody said in America called a free lunch. And that is true. You don't get anything for, for nothing. You don't get something for nothing. There will be some hidden agenda. 
Oh, please come and be the chair of this committee. Ah, thank you. I would love that. And then what? And then you're stuck with so much work. You can't do anything at all. You're stuck with all the, you know, keeping the accounts and everything because nobody is doing anything. And then they all put this on you because they know you are a workaholic and you will do it. And they take vacations and then they make you work. No such thing called a free thing. Same thing. Somebody says, come with me for a holiday. And then the person who invites you, whether they are known to you or not acquainted to you, maybe you know them a little bit. They are what? They are just a... <laughs> They, they are just a high maintenance person. So the whole weekend instead of enjoying yourself, you know, becomes a, you know, becomes a exercise in, in, uh, in uh, taking care of them. They always need something. They need emotional reassurance. They are always wanting this, that or the other. So what happened to your free holiday? Not so free, is it now? And so being able to see through everything and saying, I don't need this, I don't want this, because the, that, that you can only do when you have the trust that if the birds in the universe can make a nest without getting a PhD, so can I have a shelter over my head and the means to feed myself and my family without needing to all the time be in this flustered mode of, uh, what is that called, you know, insecurity. That is the trust. You do what you need to do. You get a job. You have a job. You keep the job. You bring home the paycheck. All that is needed. Yes, you pay the bills. And But at the same time, you know, I want more. I have to have this. And in order to be okay, I have to have that. That you let go. Then what happens? You get to the place that is described in the third line. Parityajya sarvam. You give up everything. <laughs> you give up this, give up this, give up this, give, 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 give up, give up, give up. Yad apnoti tatvam. So, yad parityajya sarvam, yad the one who gains what? Tatvam, the truth of the self. Here again, there is a cause effect connection. Only after the relative, the, the penchant for the relative has dropped, then only the absolute will uh, reveal itself. The absolute reveal as yourself. Because see, this is a funny thing. You are the one who is the pursuer and the object of pursuit is also you. What you, the you that is not an object, that happens to be the subject. That's why not knowing these people or uh, pursue the objects because people don't know how to pursue the subject. And if you were con confined, consigned to a life of sorrow, then there is no use of this pursuit because no matter how much you try, you can't, can't be happy. But you know you are happy. You know that's your destiny. Why just you? Even the pharmaceutical companies know that. That's why there are more and more antidepressants on the market because even they know that depression is not the real you. Even they know. And so therefore what? So therefore I, re, re, you know, I just uh, pull back from the finite to allow the pursuit of the infinite in the form of Shastra, teaching, Guru, teacher and and this kind of an immersion so other than this what else all the other things i give up parityajya parityajya sarvam giving up everything yad apnoti tatvam the one who understands the truth and what is the truth that is described in this line in 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 the in the last line param brahma nityam param brahma Ahameva asmi, tadeva ahamasmi, tadeva ahamasmi. The dhridata, the certain knowledge. And what is this certain knowledge? The knowledge without doubt, vagueness or error. I know that I am that which I seek to be. That which I want to be, I already am. And the word for that is Brahman. Brahman means from brihi, vridhau, big. What kind of big? Limitlessly big. Limitlessly big. And that limitlessly big Brahman, limitlessly big I am. How come you are that? Because I am that sentience. I am not the body. I am not the mind. I am not the sum total of the body-mind-sense complex. 
am much more than that. I am the sentience, that consciousness that pervades the body-mind complex and because of which the body moves, because of which the mind thinks, I am that. And that I is, is equated to the cause of the universe, which here is called Bhagavan or Brahman. Because that, see, the, the dissimilarity is obvious. How can I be Bhagavan? I cannot make the weather. I cannot make, make the Jagat. I, can, I cannot create the universe. I can only create some confusion. That's all I can do. How can I be Bhagavan? But this last one is a uh, Mahavakya. And we'll be seeing this in a little more detail next time. Because it's the refrain. You see, the next verse also, when I scroll to the next verse, what is the refrain of the next verse? Param Brahmanityam Tadevaham Asmi. Same thing. So we'll be spending some time on that to see. But for now, just for, because uh, I think some people have questions, so I want to save five minutes for questions. So I will just briefly touch upon this. So Param Brahma. Param Brahma means I am that which transcends all name and form. Because, you know, if I look at myself, I am limited. <laughs> limited body-wise, limited mind-wise, extremely limited. Finances-wise, definitely limited. Bank account-wise, definitely limited. And then what? Resources-wise, limited. Friends-wise, limited. Name-wise, limited. Fame-wise, limited. And who am I being equated to? Unlimited, limitless Bhagavan. Limitless Bhagavan. Limitless, totally limitless Bhagavan who has got limitless resources, limitless vairagya, limitless everything. And so this is that limitless Bhagavan. How can I be the same? So therefore, in the Shastra, we do first what is called Pratyagatma Siddhi. First you arrive at who the I is. The I is not this body, not the mind, much more than the body, much more than the mind. Body is I, I is not the body. Mind is I, I is not the mind. And senses of course are I, Atma. But Atma is not the senses. So the Atma I is what? That which is the quote-unquote indweller of this body-mind sense complex and the observer that is not affected by anything that it observes, including sorrow and fear. This is arrival of into the true meaning of the word I, Pratyagatma Siddhi. Then this I uh, is what? Consciousness, awareness. The awareness that is never becomes I don't know. This is an ontological I know. Because when you say I am, you are already saying I know I am. And this I know I am is very interesting. Because this I know I am never becomes I don't know. Because even when you say I don't know Chinese language, that means what? I am saying I know I don't know Chinese. I am the observer of my ignorance. I am the observer of, of the objects of knowledge. And that observer is never ignorant. I am the unignorant observer, which is this I, which is which is existent, which because I know I am, I know I am, and uh, I am, and I know I am. And this I am never comes to an end. I am now, 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 now. And the truth of now is free of time. I am that. This is how you unpack the, the I on the level of the jiva. And then the same thing you to do to Bhagavan. If you visualize Mahavishnu, first thing you do is gently take away his chakra. And you take away his shankha. Then you divest him of his crown and his wonderful yellow clothes or whatever he is wearing. And then you just sort of see what is, what is inside. Inside is again that same Satchidananda, that same consciousness wearing a glamorous robe full of bling, full of power. <laughs> the bling that represents power over the universe, the power to create, the power to sustain, the power to take back. And this is the, this is the Bhagavan. And then when you unpack the word Bhagavan, what do you get? Brahman as Satchidananda, Param Brahma. And that when you unpack the jiva, what do you get? Same thing, Satchidanandam Brahma alone. So therefore, this Param Brahmanityam Tadeva 
Aham Asmi. So uh, we will uh, we will stop here for now, and then we'll continue in the uh, next session, which will be at uh, there at four o'clock. And some people have questions or whatever it is, um, so you can you can ask the questions. Uh, you know now here you can ask the questions and see what is there. If there are any questions, I'll say the closing prayer. You can ask questions. Om Purnamadav Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Harihi Om Shri Gurubhyo Namaha Harihi Om Thank you. Somebody has raised the hand. So, um, is there a question? Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Swamini Ji. It was such an enthralling talk. I couldn't move away from my seat. Uh, and also, it was really, it uh, you know, one moment when it really struck me very deeply was when you said our journey from the baby with clinched fists yeah. till the end where our, you know, yeah. palms are wide open. Right. That was really moving for me. Um, so I might, uh, I would like to, uh, you know, request the viewers to post your questions in the Q and A box, and as they come, I would uh, relate them to Swami Niji. Yeah, yeah. Now there are no questions. Somebody raised the hand. I don't know why or whether it was an accident. Uh, so that is the, the hands are still raised. Um, yeah. Uh, somebody wrote uh, some one question is there. Uh, oh, that's just a thank you. That's, that's all. It. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Swaminiji, I had a question. May I ask? Sure, sure. Please, please um, do. So you spoke about uh, aropa, the projection uh, yes. of the mind. Aropa, yes. Aropa, exactly. So why is it that? I mean, uh, how does the mind project? Why does that happen? And uh, how do we go about becoming more observant about the projections? Yeah, very nice question. Aropa happens when the true nature of something is not known. And the, the snake rope is a stock, rope snake is a stock example. This is to show that how the fears project onto a thing that is not fully known. And then sometimes the desire also becomes the cause of projection. Like then that uh, positive example, pravritti example is called, uh, is that uh, shuktika rajatam, means the, the, the mother of pearl that is mistaken for silver on the beach. So on the beach, you see something shining, you say, oh, this is a silver dollar. And oh, it's a silver uh, uh, piece of silver, silver coin. And you run in the sand within the sun and try and you're exhausted. And then when you come to there, uh, it is a useless, not even costly mother of pearl. And so this is the, this is how uh, when the nature of a thing is not known, the projections are, you know, abide. Projections are rampant. So first I learned to, uh, you know, I learned to manage the desires, the raga and the dvesha. Dvesha for things like the snake, raga for things like the silver. When they are managed, then the projections naturally withdraw. Because the projections are the symptoms of unmanaged raga and dveshas. We cannot say we should remove the desires because removing the desires means what happens? You know, you just keep, uh, you just keep, uh, what is that? Uh, um, you, then the, then you are left with a desire to remove all desires. Then what are you going to do with that desire? Then you have another desire to remove the desire to of removing the desire. You are left with that. So you can't remove the desires. And the desires are not problematic really unless they become obsessions. So therefore you manage the desires so that they don't become obsessions. They don't sit in the driver's seat and then drive the car. You drive the car. They don't hijack you. They don't carjack you. And, uh, you know, and say, and then you cannot say, this is my karma, karma, in order to be hijacked. No, <laughs> it's not your karma to be hijacked. You, you, you have to say, let go of the wheel. This is my vehicle. This is my body. This is, this is how I want to walk in life. I want to go towards the Shastra. I want to go grow into a compassionate, uh, you know, being with a compassionate, open heart and a happy person. I want to grow into discovering myself as that. And I'm not going to let you come in the way. You have to be in the managing seat. 
and that requires a lot of uh, viveka vairagya and the, the teaching itself makes one withdraw the projections and be more one with uh, you know one with uh, uh, one with the program so the more the uh, vedanta as a desire is cultivated then the desire for other things the, the desire for the finite naturally drops it's like when you want to take candy from the hand of a baby, what do you do? You give it a teddy bear. The candy drops naturally and the baby is holding on to the teddy bear. So make uh, make Vedanta your teddy bear and then the other the, the, the desire for all these small things, this Tuchya Buddhi will definitely come and the desires will uh, naturally drop. Okay. Wonderful, wonderful. I think this is the quintessence where we draw you know we are, we are different in a way because we don't say everything is destiny we yes. have a certain amount of self pursuit and Absolutely. that comes yes. into the picture yes and Absolutely. moksha the desire for freedom is not prarabdha it's not destined it is purushartha that's why, you know, we, when, when my guru was alive, everybody used to go to him with their horoscope and say, Swamiji, will I get Poksha? Will I get Moksha? <laughs> and uh, he, he would say, you know, the, the, I can tell you the conditions for Moksha. The conditions right. for, you, the, yes, you have a life that you can, if you made the, made the will, if you made the decisions, if you decide to direct your life, the, the stars are helping you. You can do this. Right. Conditions are there, but you have to pursue. It's like taking the horse to the water, but you cannot make it drink, you know. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, we have some follow-up questions on that from the audience. Uh, sure. So, uh, so does that mean that there must be something upon which the projection happens? But yes. understanding that there is nothing so, uh, is it a projection on a projection? No, there is something on which a projection happens. The projection is happening not on a, on a non-existent thing. You can never have a projection. On zero, you cannot have a projection. You can only have a projection on an existing thing that is not, uh, you know, that is not known, that is not fully known. That is how it is. Partially yeah. known thing. So the I is not non-existent. The I is very much, you, you are there. That's why you, you say, I am here. When I ask you, do you exist? Yes, you say. And so that means the I is existent on an existent eye, but a not a fully understood eye, there are projections. I am an idiot. I am sorry. I am, you know, I am not, uh, uh, I, I don't know this. I don't know that. I have this. I have that. So it's not a projection on a projection on a projection. It's a projection on something that you haven't fully understood. Therefore, the, sit, the eye becomes a sitting duck for thinking I am something I am not. Right. Yeah. I remember uh, reading Swami Chinmayanandaji's words. He calls it misapprehension. Yes, misapprehension. Very well, very well put. Yeah, misapprehension. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, one final question, Swamiji. Uh, can we yeah. say projections lead to desires? Projections lead to desires. Yes, definitely. And it goes the other way around. Desire leads to projection. Projection leads to more desire. Yes. So you are in a sad, sorry, go round. I can't call it merry go round. A sorry go round loop. <laughs> yeah, each one buttresses the other. Here's one more question. Uh, is there a way to know uh, if we manage the desire, if we are managing the desire or suppressing the desires? Yes, wonderful question. Because if you are managing the desires, if you are suppressing the desires, you will be angry, resentful and unhappy. If you are managing the desires, you will feel victorious and you will feel good. Right. Yeah, that's what it is. Because you are in the driver's seat. That's how it is. And, okay. and it comes with a lot of unbound freedom, like you just said. Yes, you feel happy. You feel, you feel with yourself. All right. Wonderful. I think that was a very, very good note to conclude the first session. Uh, yes. I'm really looking forward to our evening session now, Swamini. Absolutely. We'll do that. And then uh, yeah. we will meet again here at 4 o'clock. Yes? Yes. Yes. Hope you. All the best. Om Tatsa. Yeah. Take Om. care. Sri Guru